Hello, hello, and welcome to an expert classroom live stream with our fantastic expert, Dr. Sandy Uliano. Hi, Sandy. Hi to all. How's it going? I'm um, well, thanks. This is Max. Hi, Max. Are we good, Max? He's quite quiet. I'll speak on his behalf. <laughs> but I can see he's being really safe with his mask. So he good is. on you, Max. Close proximity, he's got his mask on. Fantastic. Absolutely perfect. Now, today in our live stream, we're going to be chatting to Sandy about why it's so good to keep dairy in our healthy, balanced diet and how uh, eating dairy can uh, positively affect the structure of our bones. Now, Sandy, you've got a really interesting kind of job, haven't you? Your job is uh, quite centered on bones. Yeah, look, I'm a nutrition researcher, so I'm able to actually take foods like dairy foods and feed them to people of children adults and older people and to see what it does for their bones wow so what do we know about dairy and our bones the key thing with dairy um, is it's one of our main sources of calcium and so therefore we need calcium for our bones so when we're consuming enough calcium we're laying enough um, calcium into our bones making our bones stronger and bigger and thicker and it's not just about our bones is it is it does it affect our teeth as well yeah there is some really interesting research that shows with the, with milk consumption it actually helps with the enamel Fantastic. Now, I think that that kind of knowledge has been around for a while because I don't know about you, but when I was at school, I remember drinking a lot of milk and knowing that it was quite good for my teeth. Yeah, there you go. And often mums know best and often they tell you to do things and um, without even knowing, they have all the science behind it and off they go and they teach us this great wisdom and, um, you know, and what they were right. Mum's always right. <laughs> Now, it's not just calcium that we can get from dairy products, is it? We can still, we can also get protein and several vitamins and minerals. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so one of the things with the protein is um, it's a really good source of good quality protein. And our proteins are made up of what we call amino acids. So they're like little building blocks. And some of those amino acids we have to get from our diet. So you can imagine all these different building blocks. So there's 20 in total. And there's the 11 that we need to get from our diet. Well, one of these in particular that comes from um, whey, which is in dairy food, is called leucine. And leucine is like the, the top dog. And that's the one that stimulates our body to produce muscle. So by having this type of, um, this type of protein from our dairy sources, we can produce muscle. Oh, fantastic. Now, how did you get into researching bones? Where did that interest come from? Look, I've been an athlete all my life. And so for me, it was about how my activity and how my lifestyle and my exercise, my nutrition was affecting my bones. So it was a little bit that I was interested in it. And then I became interested in how we can actually help other people with their bones as well. Fantastic. So have you worked with lots of other athletes? Yeah, I've worked with athletes. I've worked with children in primary school. We did a fantastic trial in primary school because one of the things we know with bones is it's not only how much dairy and calcium you're getting and all the other nutrients, but also exercise is important for bones. Oh, fantastic. Very, very important. Now I've got a slide coming up next that can show us all of the bones in our body, well, I say all of the bones, lots of the bones in our body. Um, which bones grow the fastest? Do you know? Yeah, this is an interesting one. So when we're children, our bones in our arms and legs grow at like a nice continual rate. And then when we get to puberty, the bones in the spine start to grow a bit more quicker and the bones in the legs and arms slow down. So what we see is um, if you think about when you, if someone's got an older brother or sister, when they go through puberty, they've got really long arms and they're gangly and then the rest of the body catches up. Yeah, fantastic. Now, here's a photo of you doing some exercise. <laughs> yes, I, that was, <laughs> I've, been, I've been exercising since I was eight years old and I've been competing since then and I love competing. This was the world championships um, that I won as an age group 
um, per, uh, age group athlete. And that was uh, quite a few years ago. Um, but yeah, I love exercising, um, obviously with triathlon, which is this sport, I'm running, I'm riding and I'm swimming. So I'm looking after my bones with my running and I'm looking after my upper body, keeping it nice and strong with my swimming and looking after my lungs by my riding. Fantastic. Now, our skeleton isn't just useful for keeping us moving and uh, I guess standing us up, but it's also really good at helping us to protect the squishy bits inside us, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone watches rugby, we can see how when they collide, it's really, really hard how hard they hit. So basically our skeleton is protecting what we call all the vital organs in our body. So our heart, our lungs, our spleen, our brain, all of those are protected by the skeleton as well. Fantastic. Now this looks like, um, it, is this one, is this in Australia, your triathlon? Yeah, so this world championship was in um, on the Gold Coast and the other one I attended was in Canada. Oh, wow. Now tell us a bit about that because you've been to lots of different places around the world, haven't you, in your research? Yeah, with my research, I have. With my research, I've been very lucky to travel um, to, to Europe. I've traveled to the United States. I've traveled to South America. So I've actually been to Argentina presenting some of the work I've done to New Zealand, our great partners across the ditch, as we call it. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, present my work tonight as an example. I'm presenting some of my work at a conference that's in Spain. Oh my goodness, how exciting. That's an amazing opportunity. Yeah, it'd be nicer to be in Spain doing it, but because of COVID, um, I'm now presenting it in from my lounge room for where I am now, my dining room, I should say. And I have another presentation to do in America in a few weeks' time. So um, it would, if I was travelling, I'd be all over the world doing these great presentations. Fantastic. And is Max going to help you present tonight? Well, no, I think Max is actually going to return home. He's oh. <laughs> He's been, he's been on holidays at our house and um, he'll be going home. Fair enough. Now, what do we know about the bone structure of people from different countries and cultures? Are there any major differences there? Yeah, look, there actually is. So what we do know is that um, people that are African-American have bigger bones, thicker bones, stronger bones than people who are what we call Caucasian. So people like myself that are from Europe or from um, America or from England. So they do. So there are cultural differences that we, that we know are there. And what we do is we study perhaps why these differences are there. That's amazing. So how can that knowledge help us all as humans all together in the future? So the key thing is that um, everyone, there's a, our genetics is a really big determinant of how strong our bones are and how tall we're going to be and all those factors. So the key thing is that everyone, given what their genetics have told them they're going to be, we need to maximise our bone strength. So the key ways, again, is having enough dairy food or enough calcium from the dairy food, the weight-bearing exercise, and also we're getting enough vitamin D. Oh, now that's very important. We're going to touch on that a little bit later on because it's something I really want to think about. Now, we have talked a little bit about how our bones grow as we go through our life, but is it fair to say that we... Um, we can do the same things to look after our bones at any age we are, and they'll still be really, really strong. Yeah, look, the best time, as we're growing a bone, that's the time that we can actually make the bone as big as it should possibly be, and the bone as thick as it can possibly be. So once we're an adult, we can't lay more bone. So once we're an adult, we've got what we've got. And the key thing then is even as an adult, we have to maintain our bones. So keeping the same three lifestyle choices, enough calcium, weight-bearing exercise, and an enough sunlight exposure or vitamin D, it's the same, but they can only maintain their bone. Right, okay. We've got a question here. Someone's asking, what happens if we don't look after our bones when we're little? Well, exactly. So what happens is if we don't look after our bones when we're young and growing, they won't grow to as big as they could possibly be. And then, for example, if we continue a lifestyle that doesn't include enough exercise, 
that um, doesn't have enough dairy and calcium in it, we can start to lose our bone as an adult. So um, we'll maintain it, just maintain it. And then again, if we continue with that lifestyle, so we're going, doesn't matter about our bones when we're old, we continue not exercising, we continue not eating enough calcium, we'll lose bone a little bit quicker. Oh, now that is a bit of a scary thought. So it's definitely important to look after our bones when we're small. Absolutely. Grow it as much and as strong as we possibly can. Fantastic. And we'll go into how we can do that a bit later on. Now, as a bone researcher, you've traveled all around the world. You've spoken to all of these different people. But what kinds of tools do you use to do that? Oh, okay, so we have, when we're doing the bone density, so Max here, if we were doing his bone density, we use um, a bone densitometry machine. And basically you lay on the machine and a scanner goes over the top and it can actually look at the density. So it sort of looks at the density of the muscle, the fat, and then works out what the density of the bone is. Okay, another one we use is called, here's a big word, high resolution PQCT. And what that one can do, it can look at, at the bones in your wrist and in your ankle, but we can go even smaller still. So now we can look at how thick the bone is. We can look at how big the bone is and also the density of the bone as well. That's amazing. Because it's not just the outside of the bone that's important. There's some pretty amazing stuff happening right in the middle of our bones too. Yeah. So if you imagine your bone, it's always changing and, and um, recycling. So it's not just, it's a living tissue. So one of the things is, is that within the bone, especially when we get older, we get holes in the bone and they're called pores. And so we can actually measure the amount of holes in the bone. So the porosity of the bone. Right. That is a very big word. And I imagine you've had to learn lots of big words in your job. Absolutely. And some of the words can still baffle me, but um, often we, we abbreviate the words so that we actually know it's easier to say the abbreviation, like one of the bone markers that we can measure in your blood um, that looks at how much the bone's breaking down. We can just abbreviate it to CTX because it's a really long word. Yeah, CTX sounds a little bit easier. <laughs> a bit groovier too. Now, what do we know about the first scientists that started looking at bones? What tools would they have used? Well, years and years and years ago, they probably just used good old fashioned x-rays. So what they did, there's been some work that's quite historical and they actually looked at just x-rays and from those x-rays, they would actually just measure the size of the bone using a ruler. And what we know with an x-ray is it's still capturing um, the density of the bone just through the colours. So if the bone is a little bit translucent, so we can kind of see a little bit between it, that's probably saying it's not very, it doesn't have a lot of density to it. Whereas if it's really thick and obvious, it means that there's good density. Oh, very, very useful. Now, the next part of this session is a bit of a game. Do you fancy playing a game with me? Okay, we will. I think, that, right. I think the others, I reckon we should get people to respond to this as well before I, I give the answer. I think so. I think so. So if you guys are watching this, pop your answers in the chat box or in the Q&A. I'd love to see if you get these right. Okay, so this is a bit of a test of your knowledge, Sandy. Uh -oh. I'm going to give you a bone <laughs> name and you can tell me if it's a real bone or if I've made it up and it's not oh, really a bone. Oh, here we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so the first one is coccyx, a very interesting word. Is that a real oh. bone or a fake bone? I'm going to get the get the, get the, um, the viewers to tell me. I want to see what they come up with. Mm -hmm. I know what it is in my head. Or oh, what have we got, guys? We got. Tell me what the response is, which way, and I'll, and I'll see if they're right. Oh, oh, we got some people that aren't sure. Real. Okay, that's okay. Fake. Oh, yeah, we're not sure. Do you want to tell us? Oh. So the coccyx is a real bone and it's a small little, um, if you think of your spine, you come all the way, if I could lift Max, if he was, <laughs> I could show you. So all the way down the spine, you keep going, keep going past the pelvis and there's a little tiny end of the bone, that's the coccyx. Now, some people call that the tailbone, but we don't have tails. I, I don't know what happened, you know, millions of years ago. Maybe we did, but they do call it the tailbone because it's sort of a little piece that just sort of hangs off like a tiny itty bitty tail. 
Oh, now I do know that it really hurts if you whack it and yeah, it's a bit of a yeah, sore one yeah. to hit that one. Yeah. So try not to <laughs> land and um, on your bone. That's it. Yeah. All right, the next one is septum. Another funny word. What do we think, guys? Do we think this is a real bone or a fake bone? Going on there. Let's have a look. Septum. Oh, we got some people that know that some people are getting the right answer here. Yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna go with fake, Sandy. Is that right? Awesome. I'm thinking the closest bone to that one is the sternum, and I can actually show you on Max. I'm at a point. So That's maybe it's the closeness of the word sternum, septum, maybe, but the sternum. Fantastic. There you go. I actually made that one up. The septum <laughs> is up here in your nose. It's the wobbly <laughs> cartilagey bit. So while we're on cartilage, what's the difference between cartilage and bone? Because they kind of look the same. Do you know that when our bones grow, so if you imagine while this bone's growing in length, it started as cartilage. And then it becomes trabecular bone, which is the honeycomb bone. And then it becomes cortical bone, which is the nice hard bone. That's so amazing. The cartilage is just at the end of bone and cartilage has a little bit of softness to it. And that's at the end of all of our joints. That is amazing. How long does it take for a, a bone to go through that whole process? Well, if you think about, um, if you imagine while people are growing, as long as they're growing, that process is happening. And then when we stop growing, the process stops. That's so as long as the bone's growing in length, that can happen. Fantastic. Very interesting. All right. Now, this is one of my favorite bones, but do you know where it is? The stirrup bone. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I gave it away a little bit there. <laughs> now, what do we think, guys? Is this a real bone or a fake bone? The stirrup bone. Mm. Fake, that's on a horse. Mm -mm. Um, no, mm, real, mm, oh, we're a bit undecided about this one. What do we think, Sandy? Well, you've actually got me stumped on this one too because a stirrup for me, my daughter horse rides and a stirrup for me is what she uses on her saddle to ride her horse. So I probably know the scientific name and have never heard it called a stirrup bone. So oh. if it's real, which okay. where am I looking? And I'll tell you the real name. It is a real one. The stirrup bone, as far as I'm aware, is the smallest bone in your body inside your ear. Oh, see, I didn't know it as, this, as that. Yes, okay. Oh, go on, what do you know, Anne? No, you've got me on that one. <laughs> Does it have And a that bone is slightly different because it's not a weight-bearing bone. It's actually a bone that now enables us um, with our hearing, so... Now, that's really interesting that we've got bones that do different jobs. Are there other bones like that in our body? Mainly the inner ear is the one. But if you think um, our head's not weight-bearing, but it protects our skull, mm -hmm. our arms aren't weight-bearing unless you do gymnastics. So as an example, when astronauts go into outer space, they lose bone really rapidly from their weight-bearing sites, so from their hips and their legs, and they lose it less from their non-weight-bearing sites, their arms. That's really interesting. Are there other, um, I guess, careers or uh, people that do different jobs in the world that really do need to be aware of their bone density? Uh, look, I think astronauts is a key one, but everyone does because, for example, if I'm... Um, if I'm a builder, I need to have strong bones because I'm lifting and carrying and moving around. Um, if I'm a runner, I still need strong but light bones because I'm running. So I think everyone needs to really look after their bones. The, as I said, the astronauts lose bone in outer space. I did some research in Antarctica and those people in Antarctica are in darkness pretty much for about six months because if anyone has just Google Antarctica in winter and you'll see how dark it is. And so they're not getting any sunlight and without the sunlight, they're not getting the vitamin D. So without the vitamin D, their levels go down and they start to lose bone. That is amazing. And it just shows that all, all of that research that you're doing are directly affecting people doing specific jobs around us. Yeah, absolutely. So now we actually have um, a, um, a protocol for people that go to Antarctica. And by a protocol, we can measure their 
vitamin D before they go. And because there is no sunlight, we actually have to give them a supplement. And so we know exactly how much to give them based on what their vitamin D level was before they left. So it'd be a practical thing. Very good. Now, is that supplement in the form of a tiny cube of cheese? They do eat cheese. So no, it was actually a, a vitamin D tablet. But just so that you know, everyone in Antarctica, all the food has to be sent down there on a ship before they go. Once they're down there, so all the cheese, all the milk, I think they can make yogurt down there. I know that they use a lot of powdered milk, which they can remake. They yeah. all goes down there and they have to have all their food um, pre-loaded onto the boat, sent down there so it can last the entire time that they're down there, which might be six, seven, eight, nine, ten months. Wow, that is amazing. So how long did you spend in Antarctica? Do you know, I didn't get to go, unfortunately. Oh. All of my gear went down there and all of my research tools went down there. So it, the work we did in Antarctica was for four winters, so four seasons. So we caught people before they left, when they came back. Yeah. And then some people went down two or three times. So the next time they left, we measured them and then we measured them when they came back. Amazing. Very cool. And I know that some of our students joining us do those exact kind of skills in their own science lessons when they're setting up a fair experiment. So it just shows that all of those skills, you can use them not just in school, but in your job as well. Absolutely. So all those all those research skills that they teach you in terms of um, how to perform a research project, they're all the skills that I put into practice when I'm doing my research. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, we'll do one more real or folk, fake bone and then I've got a couple of questions for you from people. Um, so the, the last real or fake bone, we've got the hyoid. Hyoid. That's a funny word, isn't it? So Max is going to have to tell me, what do you think, Max? He's not very talkative. He's, he's not very chatty, is he? No, no. he's not chatty at all. <laughs> I wonder why. Hmm. What does he <laughs> do with his hyoid bone, maybe? <laughs> I think it's because I've um, masked him up. Potentially, yeah. <laughs> all right, what do we think, guys? Hyoid bone, real or fake? Real or fake? Fake. One, we've got one fake and one real, so let's find out. It's a real one. No. That's right. Go on then, Max, where's our hyoid bone? Max agreed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the hyoid bone, Max? He's still not saying anything. He's keeping it to himself, Max. <laughs> Come on, mate. Cat? No, he's not telling. Not telling. You'll well, have to tell I've him. got... I've got a feeling that our hyoid bone is up in our neck and it's just between our chin and the base of our neck. And uh, it can be more prominent on men. Is that right? What are you saying, Max? He's not saying anything at all. I'm not sure why Max is just not saying anything. So <laughs> never Max. mind. <laughs> All right, well, let's skip over and we've got some questions here. Uh, we've got one. Uh, what's the strongest bone in the body? I'm going to say the, um, the femur, which is our thigh bone. That's probably the biggest bone. Um, and we know if a bone's bigger and thicker, it's stronger. Fantastic. Uh, what's the difference between baby bones and old people bones? That's a good one. Wow, that's a good one. So... You imagine, a, like when a baby's born, their skulls are soft. So what happens is they start to mineralize like us and then bones become harder and harder. So a baby's bones are a little bit softer than our bones until they start to mineralize, which means they're getting the calcium and the other minerals in there. And you can imagine I've got the protein like a mesh and I've got the mineral in between to give it toughness. Fantastic. Now, if you're someone that works with bones but you don't don't really know where they come from somebody maybe like an archaeologist that could be digging up bones how would they tell how old that bone is yeah so archaeology is fantastic so they can do carbon tracing so there are particular isotopes that are naturally in um in everything and it's in the bone so they can actually do isotope tracing and they can actually work out by how much it's degraded as to how old that bone is 
Oh my goodness, that is amazing. Wow. Uh, we've got a question here from Pip. Hi, Pip. Pip says, does the number of bones in the human body change at all? Mm, yeah, that's that's actually, a great that question. Does. It actually does. When we're growing, our wrist, we call it bone age. So we can actually see a child's age by their bones and, and what's happening and it's in, in the wrist. So they take an X-ray. So some of those bones do change. And if you imagine when you're born, your skull hasn't quite joined up yet. So it's sort of pieces and then they all come together. Oh, like a jigsaw puzzle. Oh, kind of, they fuse together. You can't really see it. I can see it on Max here, but you can imagine they just fuse together. Fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. Great. All right. So on the screen here, we've got a photo of three different things that we can do to look after our bone. And we've kind of touched on a couple of these things, but the main one I wanted to talk about is exercise. Is there a fun exercise that we can all do to help look after our bones? Look, the main thing with exercise is it has to be weight bearing. So it has to be something. So if you imagine anything that I should see if Max's arm, I don't know if I can, anything that's pushing on a bone is going to strengthen the bone. So when we're running, we're pushing on the bone, we're using gravity. So jumping, hopping, skipping, all those types of activities. So did you know that gymnasts have stronger bones in their arms than average people? Because they do things like handstands and handsprings and things like that. And another thing, if you, best person to look at is Rafael Nadal. If you look at his arms, one arm's huge that plays tennis and the other arm's smaller, the bone's different on both sides as well. So wow. we find from studying tennis players, they have bigger bones and stronger bones on the arm that they hit with than on their other side. So okay. exercise is a key. Excellent. Well, if anyone out there knows Rafael Nadal and see if he wants to come onto the expert classroom, I'm sure we'd appreciate that. Um, we've got a question here about another way we can look after our bones, obviously through our nutrition, but what other foods can give us calcium? Look, the main thing, um, the other foods that can are fish with bones. So if you're going to have this, the canned salmon, so by in the can, the um, bone's broken down, so you can actually eat the bone, but you have to eat the bone with it. So sardines, anchovies, those type of fish, but you have to actually eat the bone. There are other sources. So a lot of the non-dairy um, sources, such as soya milk, but it has you have to read the label because it has to have the calcium added to it. So if it doesn't say that, it's not a good source of calcium. Fantastic. Very, very useful, especially for those people that maybe don't get a, a lot of dairy in their diet. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so let's jump on to some quick fire questions here. Uh, oh, okay, we've got questions. I don't know how quick they're going to be. Um, what's the difference between a bone fracture and a break? Look, a bone fracture, we've got lots of different fractures. You can have a fracture where the bone is cracked but hasn't snapped. You can have a bone that actually snaps and sometimes you can have a bone that snaps and protrudes through the skin. Oh, very good. And how the ones you want to avoid. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> What's the, um, how long, sorry, does it take to heal broken bones? Do they go back to the way that they have been before? Yeah, the amazing thing with bone, as I said, it's a living tissue. So basically the body will go in there and repair it. So if you imagine if you've broken a bone and someone says they have, you're in plaster for about eight weeks. So it takes the bone, the actual um, fracture maybe two weeks to start to mend but then that additional time allows that bone to work its work its magic and um, so it's going to put the two parts together and eventually they'll just fuse back into normal bone so it'll take probably around you know your plaster's on there for eight weeks um, so usually it's about eight to twelve weeks wow well that's good um, is there anything that people can do to help their bones get better faster after a break Look, the key thing when we break a bone, we immobilise it. So we put it in a sling or we put it in plaster. We need to let that first part fuse properly. So we tend to have to just leave it and let it fuse. Afterwards, so we might be sort of maybe four weeks in, we find it's actually the muscle that deteriorates because we're not using it. So we can't do much to actually change the, the bone, but what we need to do is ensure that the muscle 
And some people do what we call isometric. So they're holding it and they just are squeezing. So I'm squeezing my hand. So I'm keeping that muscle working. Fantastic. Well done. Okay. A um, couple of questions, last questions coming in. Why do people's bones ache when it's cold? Do you know, that's a really interesting one. Some people, their um, joints ache. I'll give you an example. Here you go. So I have broken a bone before. Not proud of it, but it has been broken. And it was actually in an in a accident. So the fracture site where it was broken, one of the theories is when the weather changes, if you know that they call the barometric pressure, so the pressure changes. And one of the theories is the pressure in between the fracture site is changing. So it's sort of signaling to the bone because there's air in between the where the fracture site was. And because the pressure changes, it causes a response, which is pain. So for my little finger, it does it before it snows. Wow. That is amazing, isn't it? The human body is just incredible. It is an amazing thing. And the amazing thing is that I can repair after I've broken a bone. Very good. Very good. All right. One more question to finish. Um, this is my favorite question ever. What is the difference between dinosaur bones and human bones? Wow. Well, you know what? They're probably pretty similar because in a sense, bones are a protein, like protein collagen matrix, and it has the mineral in between. So whatever that, I'm not sure what their minerals are. Like I wasn't around that time, but they'll have to be mineralized as well because you think of the size of a dinosaur, it's got to carry that dinosaur around. So its bones need to be strong. So similar protein, like a, a web of protein with all the minerals in between to give it strength. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, just before we finish, if there are, other, there are students watching us who are interested in working with bones when they um, go and find a job, what kinds of jobs are out there that people can use this kind of knowledge with? Look, there's lots of jobs. So if you imagine, so I'm a nutritionist, so I study nutrition and I've gone in to look at bones. We have people called endocrinologists and they focus on the hormones. So they look at the hormones that relate to bones. You've got people like radiologists that actually take the photo of the bones. Um, you've got archaeologists that actually study old bones. So there's lots of different ways that um, you can um, I suppose, look at bones, but in lots of different ways. We've got orthopedic surgeons that repair them. There's lots of jobs out there related to bones. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sandra. We are so happy to have you here and very, very privileged to have you in the expert classroom once again. Uh, do you want to sign off for our students? Look, enjoy. Um, I'm in lockdown. So key things, get enough calcium, do some weight bearing exercise, even if it is when you're studying in your normal recess and lunchtime, go outside, roll up your sleeves, get a little bit of sunshine, jump around um, and have fun. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And to everyone joining us, thank you so much. Thank you for all of your questions. Do jump on to KE Teacher and find out other videos on the Expert Classroom. And remember, experts don't just happen. They learn, practice and share every day. And we'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Thank you.